Don't forget to like and subscribe. Ladies and gentlemen, prepare yourselves for something extraordinary, because today's guest is nothing short of a force of nature, a true icon who has dominated the worlds of television, film, business, and beyond. Now, when we talk about Brandy Roderick, we're not just talking about a career, we're talking about a legacy that spans decades of success, reinvention, and undeniable star power. She first captured the world's attention as Playboy Playmate of the Month in April 2000, a title she just didn't wear, she owned it. Her unforgettable presence and charisma led her to be crowned Playmate of the Year in 2001, catapulting her into global fame. But this was just the beginning. Brandy used that platform to launch an acting career that would take her from the pages of the magazine to some of the biggest screens in Hollywood. On television, she became a household name as the stunning and fearless Lay Dyer on the most watched television show in history, Baywatch, starring alongside none other than Jason Momoa. From lifeguarding on the beaches of Malibu to holding her own in blockbuster films like Starsky and Hutch with Ben Stiller and Owen Wilson, and the nanny diaries opposite Scarlett Johansson, Brandy has dominated Hollywood. She's proven her versatility time and again, and venturing even into the horror genre with spine-chilling performances in Dracula 2 Ascension and Hood of Horror alongside Snoop Dogg. But Brandy just isn't the star on the screen. She's a powerhouse behind the scenes, too. As a producer, she's built her own production company from the ground up, overseeing a slate of feature films, including Ace and the Christmas Miracle, Twisted Vines, and the highly anticipated Wineville, a film described as Texas Chainsaw Massacre meets Hallmark. She's a visionary with an unmatched eye for storytelling, proving time and time again that her creativity has no limits. And if that's not enough, this incredible woman took the business world by storm on NBC's The Celebrity Apprentice, where her intelligence and tenacity propelled her into the final stages in one of the show's highest rated seasons. She was so exceptional that she was invited back for Celebrity Apprentice All-Star, cementing her status as a top-tier competitor and entrepreneur. Now her savvy extends far beyond entertainment, having founded her own networking platforms, Financially Hung, and partnering with Adam Levine to bring Italian luxury to the world with Pentafolio de Oro, and even being a spokesperson for Algolide 88. But even with all of that success, Brandy continues to explore new horizons with a YouTube show at Home with Brandy, offering fans a peek into her culinary world, blending indulgence and health with delicious cheap breakfasts and gourmet creations like truffle cheese. And this just isn't a side project. It's an extension of her ever-expanding empire, showing that Brandy can do it all. A true Renaissance woman, she's also a published author with motivational guide, Bounce, Don't Break. Brandy's Guide to Life, Love, and Success, where she shares the wisdom behind the incredible career in life. As if all of that weren't enough, Brandy dedicates herself to numerous charitable causes, balancing her remarkable professional life with the joys of being a devoted mother. So buckle up and get ready to be inspired by one of the most captivating, multifaceted, and unstoppable women in the world today. From the golden beaches of Baywatch, to the competitive boardroom of Celebrity Apprentice, from the covers of Playboy to the director chair, to some of the most exciting films of the decade. This woman does it all with grace, power, and heart. Please join me in welcoming the living legend, the one, the only, Brandy Roderick. Brandy, welcome to the show. Wow is right. Holy moly. That is probably the most remarkable introduction I have ever had. Thank you so much. Can you send that to me? I think I want to use that as my bio. <laughs> you know, oddly was enough, when I, was, when I was writing this, I actually had to cut that back. Uh, there's probably about two or three other pages that uh, I wouldn't be wow. able to fit in today. I love it. That that was amazing. Thank you for all of that. You made my day. <laughs> <laughs> well, Brandy, I want to dive into it with you here. Let's talk Wineville. Yes, but are you actually drinking coffee? Oh, for me, I, I, I am. Yes. Oh, see, I, I got my cappuccino and Ooh. you're lucky that it's a Friday because this late in the day, if I was drinking cappuccino, I'd be up all night. But it's Friday night, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we can stay up as late as we want. Cheers. Yes. No school tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, oh, yeah, your, your your movie Wineville, which is out, it was described as Texas Chainsaw Massacre meets Hallmark. I love this combination. What can audiences expect from the film? Well, they can definitely expect to be shocked. Uh, my film is not for the faint at heart. I will say that um, I have lots of plot twists in the film. And when people leave the theater or leave, you know, leave the film, I, I just hope that they were completely unexpected. Like things that happened were just completely unexpected. I want them to be shocked and I want them leaving saying, holy crap, I was not expecting that. So I, I, when I watch a film, you know, I watch it and I always try to figure out who's the killer, who's doing this, mm -hmm. you know, what's happening. And a lot of times I figure it out. So I really wanted to make a film that people are just totally shocked at the end and they thought they had it figured out, but they didn't. And I really hope and feel that I accomplished that with people. I really want them to be, you know, completely shocked. I love it. Every good movie needs at least one more twist. Yes, and mine has quite a few. <laughs> now, it, now it is no surprise. It's no surprise that you're both actress and producer behind Wineville. So, how do you navigate wearing those two hats on set? You know, it very um, well. Difficultly, I will say, it was not easy. Um, but I love it. I love every minute of it. I love producing. I love acting. But there were moments, you know, we were shooting this um, towards the end of COVID. So we still had all the um, COVID restrictions through SAG. Um, so we had so many things, you know, that that happened. So that the very first day, our wardrobe stylist got COVID. And this is not just a normal film that's you know shot in today's day this is a film based in 1978 so the wardrobe is you know all 70s clothes it's not like they could just run out and run to the department store and grab something so um you know we had to like really figure that out really quickly and there were just um there were just so many things that that happened on set where i had to run and put out fires and then run back and get in you know be like okay action and then be in the scene, right? So it, it was, um, it was rough. It was a, uh, you know, it, it, I didn't have a huge team. It was me running around doing everything mostly as far as the producer side of it. So, so it, it was tough, but again, I love it and it was well worth it. it was so much fun. I want to ask you this next question here. It is a little bit of a, a sensitive subject for people that are out there who were alive in 1926. Um, yeah. Where you filmed Wineville, which was at Mira Loma, which is actually once called Wineville, uh, where unfortunately the chicken coop murders took place from 1926 to 1928. Was this kind of a, a happy accident that you got to film there and have your, you know, the, the movie named after? Or was it just kind of, oh, wow, I didn't know that. And here we are. Or was it part of that creepy horror genre that we were going for? Uh, definitely part of the creepy horror genre that we're going for. Um, you know, so for people that don't know this, the story, um, there was a hurt, there were these horrific murders that happened in 1926 to 28 in the town of Wineville on Wineville road, right where we were shooting. Um, and it was murders of, of young children, young boys. Mm -hmm. And the, the the bad press and the bad media from these horrible murders was so terrible that they had to change the name from Wineville to Mira Loma so that people wouldn't associate the chicken coop murders with the town of Wineville. So they completely just changed the name of the town. And, you know, we decided, well, no, we want to still call our movie Wineville. We're not going to call it Mira Loma. Wineville is, you know, where it happened. It's happened right here, right on Wineville Road, where we're shooting. And the street is still called Wineville, Wineville Road. Um, and so it really lends itself to the creepiness of our story and, you know, almost leaves people, uh, you know, wondering, could this be part of um, that guy's family, you know, that came later? Um, because it is kind of so close. So, yeah. <clears throat> That's it's a, it's a creepy story, but you know what? When all of the horror fans are out there, 
looking for something with more practical effects and something that isn't so super CGI and period pieces like the 70s, yes. you're really going to get that chill. Yeah, definitely. That was something that was hugely important to me is I wanted to have the practical effects. I didn't want to do CGI. I know true horror fans want practical effects. They want it to feel real. They don't want the CGI because you can really tell when people are doing CGI. So I wanted to do that for the horror fans because I'm a horror fan. Um, so I wanted to stay true to that for them. I want to ask you this question. I read this I'll say, I'll, I'll say I read it. That's not entirely true. <laughs> but there's a story that I heard where when you were young and we're going to dial time all the way back, you and your family would actually go camping in the backyard and set up a little television and watch horror movies in a tent. And then when your, your father would actually come by and scare the heck out of everybody in the tent, do you think that this kind of started the inspiration behind your love of horror? Um. I was like tormented by my parents my whole life <laughs> in a good way. Uh, it all started when I was six years old. I watched The Exorcist with my mother for the first time. That was my first uh, introduction into horror films. Um, and then when I was 10, I watched The Rabid with my parents and I went down the long, dark hallway to go to the bathroom after the movie's over. And when I was coming back, my dad was on the ground, grabbed my leg with foam coming out of his mouth like he's rabid. He had put toothpaste in his mouth, um, foaming to the mouth. Um, the backyard scene was uh, every year on my birthday, we watched a scary movie one year with Sleepaway Camp and we'd always go out to the backyard and uh, about a half hour into being in the backyard to sleep with my friends, my dad would come out and scare all of us with flashlights under his chin, shaking the tent, making noises. Um, there was even another time where my brother and I were inside the house watching a scary movie and my dad came in through the door with, which we didn't know it was him, but a stocking over his face and a knife like he's a serial killer. Um, so I had lots of moments like that, that, um, really shaped my love for horror and, um, scaring people. I love scaring my best friend, Mary now to this day, I always do everything I can to try and scare her. Um, so it's been a part of uh, my family. It's been in my blood for a long time. <laughs> if someone yeah. said to you, what are your, what are your top five favorite horror movies? What would you go with? Uh, well, I would have to go with Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Um, I'd have to go with Nightmare on Elm Street, Last House on the Left, mm -hmm. um, a new one that's crept up in my, um, probably my top five, which I loved Black Phone. Um, that was the new one with Ethan Hawke. Um, and then my fifth one would have to be Wineville. <laughs> no, I love it. Yeah. Now we're going to go back in time. And as I said, we're kind of jumping around with your amazing career. And this is going to go way, way, way before you were born. And I'm sure you've told this story, story a thousand times and people may or may not remember. But when your mother was pregnant with you, we were about two weeks late. Uh, the story goes that she was like, I got to get you out. And she started walking towards a family member's home a few miles away. When she yeah. arrived, she got inside and saw a Playboy magazine and she was thrumming through the pages and looks down and sees this amazing woman and says, man, I, I really want my daughter to one day look like this and notice that uh, her name was Brandy. But at the time, your mother had thought to call you Tony. And then she looked down and saw and said, no, you're now going to be Brandy with an E. Yes. Well, that you said it perfectly. That is the story. Um, but you did leave out that when she she went to get a glass of water first, <laughs> and then <laughs> sat down. <laughs> but yes, um, the girl's name was Brandy with an E. This beautiful woman in this magazine, and her her mind was changed. It is no longer I was no longer going to be Tony. I am now going to be Brandy, and so that's yeah. It's a it's a crazy story and. You know, so started the journey and love of Playboy and me, you know, wanting to be in Playboy, right? Like you have to live up to, gosh, I got to live up to my mom's, you know, imagination and her dream of her daughter being, you know, looking like this woman in this magazine. Um, so, yeah, it, it's a really fun story. I love it. I'm so glad that I got the chance to to know Hef and tell him the story as well. So, uh, yeah, it's a fun story. So, well, I'm, I'm happy that you corrected me. I'll have to add the glass of water next time. 
But while yes. we're while we're back in the past year, you know, we're we're going through school. You started performing uh, little shows for the neighborhood with your brother, charging an admission fee that fueled your entrepreneurial spirit. But now you're in the classroom and all the teachers are saying, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to be when you grow up? And they get to little Brandy. And I would love for you to share with us what little Brandy said. So I think you're going to say it a lot better than myself. Oh, well, I mean, I, I did tell my fifth grade teacher that I wanted to be in Playboy, that I wanted to be a playmate. Um, yeah, I, I definitely, that was at a very young age, but for, you know, fourth and fifth grader no even knows about Playboy. <laughs> so so it's, yeah, that's, that. it's mm -hmm. so remarkable that, you know, everyone knows that you got the acting bug when you were, when you're young, they knew that this is what you wanted to do. And you're like, Oh, I gotta be there. And your mother's influence of saying, geez, one day, I really hope this is where you end up. I mean, it was just kind of always in your head growing up all through school that these are the things I'm going to do. But, wow. you know, all of these things online and everything that we read about you, it's, hey, you you graduated early out of school. You, you went to post-secondary, graduated early. You couldn't get out into the workforce fast enough. And you started a real estate. You got your real estate license. You started selling and then you were going from there so when when you were in school just saying hey i gotta get out of here was it just you were bored you felt that you know i, I need something more challenging or hey get out of my way from making money yeah it was for me it was a waste of time i needed to get out in the world i had goals um i wanted to you know be a film actress i wanted to be in playboy i wanted to own my own home by the time i was 25 um, so, you know, hence, you know, the real estate license, I got that right away. As soon as I turned 18, um, graduated on my 17th birthday, took a year to get my real estate license, did that, did re real estate for a while, did all my stuff in San Francisco, you know, um, extra roles on TV shows like Nash Bridges. I even was an extra in like movies like The Rock and, and Metro with Eddie Murphy, but, you know, I went as far as I could in San Francisco and then it's like, okay, I'm not getting any younger. The ripe old age of 22, 23, I better hurry up and get to Hollywood um, and, you know, decided to finally make the move. But I had lots of goals um, that I needed to accomplish and um, I wasn't going to, I didn't want to stick around and just be in school, you know, for another year. I had to get moving. I had to get stuff going. <laughs> but that was the goal. What I love about it is that you just knew that you had to get it out of the way and move forward and, and get there. And when we talk about real estate and, you know, buying and selling homes, did you ever get into one of these situations where you said, you know what, I'm just going to flip this myself. I, I can do all these repairs. I don't need to hire someone, you know, let, let's get her back on the market. Oh yeah. I, I've done that uh, quite a few times in my life. I love taking a piece of doo-doo and turning it around, putting lipstick on it and like, you know, and making it special again. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I love that. That's like one of my favorite things to do is to turn something around that, that people didn't have a vision for, like even the home I live in now, um, it was a, uh, like a, uh, not a repo cell, what's it called? Um, but it was owned by the bank and, and nobody wanted it. They didn't see the vision. And I came in here and I was like, are you kidding me? This house is amazing. Oh my gosh. I'm going to cut down this wall, chop down this tree, do, do all the things. And now because of that, and because of my vision, I have my dream house. So this, that's something that I, um, am really good at. I love going in and seeing what other people don't see and then making it really special. Where do you believe the love for that came from? This interior design, decorating, and, you know, I hate to say interior design flair, but even the renovation flair of just walking in and saying, I know how to do this. You have that such yeah. confidence in doing it. Did anything happen along the, in your lifetime where you said, you know what, I just naturally have this confidence? Well, it started from my family. I mean, my great grandfather um, my, I come from a really creative family mm -hmm. and my great grandfather was, um, he, he made furniture out of, you know, he made wood furniture, you know, out of wood, he made lamps out of wood. He, he was a poet. 
Um, you know, so, and my mom can do anything. She's super creative, but all my life, my parents did just that. They knocked down walls, they remodeled, they learned it themselves and they did it. And even when I was, um, 16 years old, we, we moved into, um, this big, huge 100 year old Victorian and it was a, a crack house, like a literal, um, crack house for homeless people. Um, so we, uh, that just to give you an idea of what it looked like. Mm -hmm. So in order, each one of us kids had to do our own room. So I had to, you know, hang drywall, um, paint, you know, carpet, like the whole thing. So it's just was a part of my life growing up ever since as far back as I can remember. It's what my family did. Um, so we're just really creative people and get hands on and get in there and get it done. I love that because it's one of these pieces where as you go through life, you realize that you really do need to be handy. Otherwise, someone else is going to come by and surprise you with something and take advantage of what could or couldn't be there or just simply do a bad job. But if you're mm -hmm. able to do it yourself and say, actually, that looks wrong, especially with the power of YouTube these days where you could almost Google anything or YouTube anything. Yep, 100%. Even like, for example, I had to have someone come and um, fix my washer. And I had already gone on YouTube and did everything I could for, all, you know, all the diagnostic, everything, which I could not replace the um, the computer board. But anyway, so the guy came, I said, I already checked this, this, and this, and this. And so the only possible thing it could be is this or this. So, you know, it's like you do your homework ahead of time so they know they can't come in and just, you know try and take advantage. So I always check things out. I always try to fix everything first. And I try to teach that to my children too. try to, um, I teach them to fix it. My, my oldest son just put together a whole huge 14 foot trampoline all by himself. Wow. So, yeah. yeah. And actually uh, one of your sons is in the movie uh, Wineville as well. Yeah. Yes. Keaton. My Was oldest. this his, uh, his first acting debut? Uh, no, we did a Christmas movie together um, prior to this one. So it's kind of funny going from Christmas to horror. <laughs> um, <laughs> but he played my son in that movie as well. So that, that was a lot of fun as well. And when we talk about making these movies, you launched your own production company in 2000. So what inspired you to leap into the producing chair, make a company and have your own vision of these stories that you wanted to tell? Well, originally when it started, uh, 20 years ago, at least. Oh my gosh, time flies. Um, I created she Productions because I wanted to remake she Um, And, you know, that was the whole reason I put it all together. But little did I know, you know, it's very hard to try and get the big companies like Mattel and, um, you know, try to get them on board. Just some little girl that just started, you know, in her career. Um, so along the way, I've done little things and created projects and reality shows and different things and other films. And finally, with Wineville, this was 100% my production. So that was really, you know, exciting to finally um, bring, you know, my labor of love to the screen. Now with but someday, I might still do Shira. <laughs> I, listen, I, I'm all for it. I hope you do. And you know, as, as many know, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe had the twin sister, She-Ra. And can you give us uh, your best She-Ra battle cry? Ooh, yeah, okay. By the power of Great Skull, I am She-Ra! <laughs> I love it. <laughs> you know, I was actually She-Ra uh, for Halloween in 2000. And I took my She-Ra doll into the um, the costume maker and said, I want you to make her exact costume. So um, they made it and I got to wear my She-Ra costume in 2000 and it looked identical to She-Ra's. So it was pretty fantastic. That was a lot of fun. I love that story. And, you know, mm -hmm. Brittany, when we look at your filmography, you've done comedy, you've done drama, you've done action, and now you're in horror. What do you believe is the most challenging genre as an actress? Um, I think that drama where you have to be, um, fully immerse yourself into tragedy. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, because that sticks with you, you know, as an actress or an actor, um, when you're doing a role and you have to feel pain and, um, you know, immerse yourself in that pain, you can't just shake it off. 
So that is the hardest for someone that has to go and live life and take care of kids and be a happy mom and, you know, that kind of thing, because it's hard to just switch off. Um, so I would say that's the hardest, that would be the hardest right now. Um, and then comedy, of course, being the easiest because <laughs> it's, it's the most light, it's the most fun and easy. So, um, yeah, two extremes there for sure. So when we look at these genres and we look at, you know, the agent calls you, you get the email, here's the breakdown. How does Brandy prepare for that audition that comes through? Uh, well, I have to figure out what is it that my character wants what, from the other person? What What is it that my character needs from the other person? Um, that's first and foremost. And then I put together a backstory for myself. Um, and then, you know, really listening to, to what the other person is saying is very important. Now, when we talk about auditions, we get the call, you landed it. And, you know, from Baywatch to movies like Starsky and Hutch and the Nanny Diaries and all the genres in between, what do you believe was one of the most pivotal moments in your acting career? Um, well, I mean, getting Baywatch, um, getting the lead when I auditioned actually for a smaller role and they ended up giving me the lead role in the show, which they didn't even, they wrote me that part. Um, that, you know, that was pretty exciting and really, um, boosted my, um, confidence as an actress and getting that really was huge for me because I was living in Los Angeles, you know, constantly auditioning and to get this role and get to go and live in Hawaii, you know, which was just an absolute dream, um, in my, you know, early and mid twenties, it was just the perfect timing and perfect setting for me. So that was a really um getting that series regular role really helped my my career and then from there you know even getting to work with Ben Stiller and Owen Wilson and Academy Award winning director Todd Phillips mm -hmm. um you know from the Joker that I mean, getting to work with him I mean that's just those are things that not everybody gets to do and so I just feel blessed and humbled that I got the chance and working with Scarlett Johansson. I mean, just some wonderful people I got to work with and every experience I've had has been really wonderful and amazing. When we talk about these other actors and you know, Todd Phillips and everyone in between that you've had the opportunity over the span to work with, what are, what are some of kind of the key takeaways? What's the one constant that you've said, Hey, you know what? I'm learning the same thing from all of these people. Well, the one thing about um, really good big stars is they come to work prepared mm -hmm. and they're ready to go. They know their lines, they're prepared, you know, and it's funny because sometimes you go on the smaller independent films and some of the actors, they don't come on, on set prepared and you might not see them again, right? Because of that reason. But, uh, you know, the really big stars, they are really prepared at all times. So I, I love taking a note out of their book for that um, because I, I am an overly um, prepared person. I like being prepared. And I, I just, I do love seeing that, um, that they come to set ready to rock and roll. Now, in, in your world, is there any director or co-star or even genre that you have yet to step into that you'd say, you know, I'd really like to be with this director, that actor, and in this genre? What, what would you say? Well, it's funny you say that because right now, because um, I'm really big into law of attraction and manifestation and visualization. So I've been visualizing that that my next big movie is going to be with Will Ferrell. Mm. And um I say that because my kids really love Will Ferrell. So I think that would be really fun for them to have their mom in a movie with Will Ferrell. So that's, that's the next um, big blockbuster I think is going to be with uh, Will Ferrell. And I would be great if Todd could direct it again. <laughs> let's, let's make it happen people. Let's yeah. get Todd and Will and Brandy all together. Let's do this. Yeah. Yep. So I want to talk to you a little bit about your book, Bouncing Back. Now you emphasized bouncing back from challenges in both your personal and professional life. What inspired you to write the book in the first place? Um, well, 
when I was in Playboy, I was a little bit older than the other uh, playmates being in my, you know, mid twenties. Um, so all the other girls were younger and they always kind of looked up to me and came to me for advice. And I was always giving advice to these young girls. And I thought, you know what, I should just write this down and create a book. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what started it. Um, so I wanted to have something out there for people that, um, they could be inspired by and maybe learn from my mistakes, like telling people what I did that didn't work and telling people what I did that did work, um, you know, to kind of help people along the way, because I know for myself, I'm like a sponge. I want to, I want to read every self-help book and every book I can, that's going to help me get to where I want to be. So I kind of wanted to help out that, um, you know, that group of people that, you know, might benefit from, from what I have to say. So that's kind of where, where it all started. And it was a lot of fun because Playboy called me once they got the book and read it. And they said, Brandy, we want to order a hundred of these books because what we want to do is give one to every single girl that becomes a playmate. So that was really fun for me because that's almost, you know, why I did it. And then they ended up, you know, giving it to every new playmate, which was great. It's this beautiful topic about empowering right? We're, we're talking about manifesting and getting the dreams out there and putting it out to the universe, writing your book to help motivate and inspire everybody else. And to get that phone call, a hundred copies, let's go. Every playmate is going to read your book. Yeah. What do you believe this empowering message was sent out into the universe? Did, did you ever think that, Hey, I'm here's my book. Here's my motivation. Here's my advice. And then were you manifesting at that time to say, this has to explode. This has to make a larger impact. No, it, I didn't have that dream for that book for it to, you know, to explode, but I just hoped it was going to help people. And I'm so glad that it did. And I, I get messages still to this day about people. And you know what, the one thing that I was surprised about, I thought it was just going to be for, you know, younger generation of girls, but I have guys that have read my book that they say they were inspired by it and they loved reading it. So, um, I just, I, I love um, getting the feedback, you know, when people have read the book and that's, that's really, that's the most important thing to me is that I was able to help somebody in some way. It doesn't have to be, you know, an exploding thing, but as long as, you know, I'm at least, you know, helping a small few, then I'm, I'm happy with that. One of the large takeaways I, I found from it was the title alone, bouncing back. A lot of the time people get beat up, shut down. Okay. We're defeated. And instead, well, wait a minute, put your socks back up. Let's go. Come on. You can get back from this. There isn't anything that someone's going to handle it, give you that you can't handle. Yep. Bounce. Don't break. That's right. That's right. Now, when we talk about bouncing and breaking, and we know that you've been multifaceted with all of your different adventures and, and avenues of companies and entrepreneurship, entrepreneurial spirit, some people, as we spoke earlier, knew that you were the spokeswoman for Alkaline 88. But what others might not know is that you're very health conscious with alcohol, with a alkaline lifestyle. Mm -hmm. What are some small and impactful changes you could recommend to people who are, who are new to this? Um, well, I mean, alkaline water is a great, easy first step um, because when your body is acidic, that is a breeding ground for disease. Um, and, and disease cannot live in an alkaline environment. This is just, you know, uh, uh, science, I guess, you know, it's just, it's part of your body. You cannot, disease does not feed off of an alkaline environment. So alkaline water is a very first way to, to start. If you can't afford to buy alkaline water, you can actually make alkaline water with, um, baking soda and lemon. Um, you can probably Google, you know, the exact, uh, measurements, but, alkaline water, you want to get your body as alkaline as possible, um, eating more fruits and vegetables than you are uh, meat and dairy. Um, you know, the meat and dairy is, is, you know, unfortunately, those are the bad things that that we put into our body. Um, but, you know, and I do, I, I wish I was vegan, but I'm not. Um, but because I'm not, I really try to eat a lot more fruits and vegetables than I do. Um, the meat and the dairy, but just, you know, and, and, and smaller portions, you know, we don't need to, um, you know, they're tricking us in the world because back in the day, 
Um, they used to have, you know, all of our plates were small mm -hmm. and now they're making them big. So they're making us, you know, think that we need to fill up our plate and the plates are almost double the size than what they were back in the day. So get yourself the normal size plate, which I think, um, oh, I want to say they're nine inches, which are the, the smaller normal. And now they're making them like 12 to 14, but um, smaller portions. And once you start eating smaller portions, your stomach will shrink and you'll, you'll eat smaller portions. You don't need all the crap. Um, also, you know, don't eat past six o'clock at night. Um, if you can, I mean, obviously if you're working, you can't, there's nothing to do right. about that. Um, but you know, you don't, the, the key is you don't want to go right to sleep after you eat. So, you know, if you can try and I always make dinner and have it ready, you know, somewhere between five 30 and six, um, you know, that that's key is just not going to sleep on that full stomach where it's just sitting there. Um, exercise, I don't want to use the word exercise, do something active every day. You know, even if it's just getting out and walking, um, I walk, uh, four times a week and then I jog three times a week and I just get out and I'm not doing it for a long period of time. It's two and a half to three miles. I do the loop around my neighborhood. Um, and, and you get it done, you get it done in 40 minutes and you're back and, and, and you're done for the day, but do something, or even, um, I do 20 minute Pilates just on my floor in my bedroom. I literally just go on YouTube and say 20 minute full body Pilates. And so it's free. You just, I put it on there. I get on my floor and I do it. And that's just something active. I think that is really important just to, to stay active. Um, but just do small things and figure out what you enjoy. Like for me, I love getting out and walking or jogging because I love being out in nature. So for me, that's something I enjoy, but find something you actually enjoy. Um, and it'll make it easier. That's where I listen to my books, you know, find a great book that, that you're excited to read and it's going to make the walk or the run go by like that. Um, so that's a, something that will make it easier for you as well. And with everything that you've done with your career thus far, and with the exception of looking to work with Will Farrow and Todd, what's one thing that's left on your bucket list to do? Oh, um, you know, for me, bucket list items are travel items. Um, I want, I want to take my kids to Africa for their, um, graduation present. I want to go to, um, Egypt. Um, you know, I, the, for me, it's just more like, a traveling bucket list stuff because as far as career goes honestly i i've done everything that i could have ever dreamt for and imagined you know being on the big screen with huge stars working with huge directors directing myself making my own film being in the number one watch show in the world not just the nation in the world so i've really hit so many amazing milestones as far as career goes um i will continue and always work um because i love it but now my my goals and milestones and bucket lists are stuff that are for my kids you know i want them to um, reach their goals and i will do everything and anything in my power to help them reach their goals and travel to amazing places so that for me is what's next um, as far as that type of stuff. And with everything that we're talking about here, you know, your, the bucket list of, of traveling, helping and being there for our kids. Is there anything, let, let's say, is there maybe a, a hidden talent or a passion that your fans might not know about? Hmm. Well, a hidden passion or talent. Oh, gosh. I don't know. I don't really have any. I mean, I do love music. I love learning to play the piano. Um, so that's, you know, that's something that I'm sure I will continue learning because I do love music. And when I hear the piano, it, it uh, evokes, you know, something inside me that's um, really inspiring. So, I mean, I'll probably continue that path, but again, that's more something for myself, right? Just to enjoy, but yeah. And Brandy, if someone said to you, what's something that scares you the most, what would you say? Um, my children not living their dreams. 
Yeah. And uh, what do you think is something that people tend to misunderstand about you the most? Well, I think that, you know, with any um, buddy who has been, let's say, in Playboy, Baywatch, blonde hair, um, you know, just kind of the misconception of uh, a pretty blonde female actress model, um, maybe, you know, not having the smarts to go out there and and do what I've done, which, you know, honestly has really um, given me the motivation throughout my whole life to strive and become a better person anyway. So for me, it's actually been fuel to my fire. But I think that that could be something that people might think, you know, because of appearances. Mm -hmm. And Brandy, where can people learn more about you? Where can we find you on social media? Where are your websites? Let us know. Um, well, winevillemovie.com is where you can go and find all the links to go and watch Wineville this weekend, uh, which is our first weekend out, which is really exciting. Um, and then brandyroderick.com has more information about myself. But um, Brandy Roderick is all of my social media is just my name. And then Wineville Movie on all of the social media platforms. So would love for you guys to come and say hi and send me a message and um and watch the movie this weekend exciting stuff everyone get to google and make sure you check it out and uh brandy what, what's your favorite type of coffee or cup of coffee that you like to have in the morning well um i am really excited because i just got a new delonghi coffee maker Ooh. And it's so cool because I had the Keurig before and I'm like, yeah, this is just too watered down for me. Finally broke down and got the DeLonghi. Oh my gosh. My coffee every morning is so good. I do whole bean, dark roast Starbucks or Pete's coffee and it's whole bean. It's so good. But today I made a cappuccino because you can make cappuccino out of them. That's why I'm talking so fast. I had a cappuccino. <laughs> um, <laughs> but the weekends, I always make a cappuccino in my um coffee maker but all, during the week i have my normal black coffee with my shobani vanilla creamer and uh brandy i have time for one last question for you today with coffee with chris and you've been absolutely a pleasure what's something that makes brandy roderick smile oh being with my children i know i keep talking about my children but it, it is what lights me up seeing them happy watching them laugh watching them smile seeing them accomplish things for me that's what makes me smile I love that answer. And as I said to you, this is the last question I had for you today on Coffee with Chris. Everyone out there, go to Google, Brandy Broderick, when you get the opportunity. Check out Wineville. It's going to be absolutely amazing. Remember, Texas Chainsaw Massacre meets Hallmark. So you're definitely going to want to see it. Uh, everyone out there, remember to smile to inspire and have a fantastic day. Thank you so much for your time today, Brandy. Mm -hmm.